Hi. Hi. Welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. In this lecture from week eight, we're going to be just going through some examples of potentiometric sensors. And my purpose in talking through these examples is not so much to get you really specific about how these sensors are getting used, but to get you to think about the advantages and the disadvantages, particularly of ion selective electrodes, as an instrumental method for measuring things like metals. So the first example I want to address is acid rain. So you may or may not know that emissions from both coal-fired power plants as well as cars can introduce SOx and NOx or SOx and NOx into our atmosphere. Both of these can create acid rain. And acid rain has a number of effects both on man-made structures as shown here. It can dissolve statues and buildings. It can also contribute to deforestation and the destruction of habitats. So acid rain has been a large problem. And in recent times, the limits on particularly sulfur emissions have reduced acid rain quite a bit. But it remains a problem for much of the world. So this is a map of the United States in which the pH was measured in rainwaters over the span, I think, of about a year. And in this survey, they had to use many, many labs from all over both the U.S. and Canada to sort of simultaneously collect rainwater, make the measurements. So there were a whole bunch of different laboratories involved. They were all measuring pH. And if you look at these lines, hopefully what you can see is that, first of all, there was a real problem with acid rain in the industrial northeastern part of our country, which is not surprising because that's where most of our emissions were. But you can also see that there are differences between 4.2 and 4.4 pH, or even 4.6, and that those differences are really significant and actually influence things like the policies about setting what the threshold limits will be on SOx and NOx emissions at various places in the country. So not only was it important to measure pH in many, many different locations, um, I done actually by different laboratories, but it was also important to be able to understand if one area had a higher pH measurement than another, and that the 0.2 to 0.1 pH units were the kinds of changes that you cared about. So it gives you a sense of how precise your measurements need to be. If you're measuring pH with plus or minus 0.5 pH units, it's not going to be very useful in creating these kinds of data. What I'm showing you here is some data taken both before and after certain kinds of calibration. So over here on the left is data taken on the pH of the exact same sample, but it was measured by 17 different laboratories, all with slightly different pH instruments. And as you can see, the variation in the pHs was actually quite extreme. It certainly looks like a standard deviation not much better than about 0.08 pH units. And that's pretty high given that we care a lot about shifts of 0.1 pH unit for policy. So this was really problematic, and I think it really illuminates one of the problems with electrochemical sensors, which is that they are subject to a great deal of both random and systematic error. So in this case, over here on the right, you can see a vastly improved data set in which the all 17 different labs did something different. What they did is they calibrated differently, and it's a little bit of a subtle difference. But normally, when you calibrate a pH meter, you vary the concentration of pH using a buffer. Um, a buffer is a mix of salts that fixes the pH such that if you add acid or you add base, you're not going to change the pH much. So you'll have a lot of ionic strength present in buffers. What that's going to do if you're using buffers to calibrate your pH is that the good news is that things like dissolved CO2 and other things are not going to influence the pH of your calibration solutions. The bad news is that the ionic strength of those solutions, if they're going to be in the outside of your pH meter, they're going to contribute to the junction potential or the boundary potential that you're actually measuring, both at your um, bulb and at your reference electrode. And so as a consequence, you're going to see bigger systematic errors due to those kinds of potentials in the presence of buffered solutions as opposed to solutions that were just dilute acids. So what they did to clean this up is they hypothesized that was the problem, and then they ran their calibrations instead of with buffers, just really dilute acids, and they had to be careful about purging the samples and everything. Um, in any case, that's what cleaned up their data and got their standard deviation across all these labs down into an acceptable range.
And so that's just an example of one of the problems of working with these systems is that you cannot necessarily assume that just because you've calibrated your instrument and you're using it what you think is in a proper way, that you're going to have exactly the same kind of data as another laboratory. That's in contrast to something like ICP-AES. Remember, atomic emission spectroscopy, much bigger instrument. That was a much more reliable and from lab to lab would have been much, much more precise than what we see here. A second example, and it pretty much just reiterates the last one, is calcium in blood. And calcium in blood is a particularly challenging measurement, not because the calcium levels are particularly low, but because blood has so much stuff in it. Um, blood has a lot of proteins, all sorts of lipids, and so when you're doing a measurement, an electrochemistry measurement, calcium's got to get close to some sort of ion-selective electrode, you've got proteins and other junk to worry about. Now, you'll go through separation processes with the blood to hopefully get rid of some of it, but you're still going to have a lot of other material, big, complicated, biological material present when you measure the calcium. And that's going to be a problem because you need to measure calcium to about 5 or 10 percent given the sort of medical information that's needed. So you need a pretty precise measurement of calcium. And so again, um, in this case, rather than a lot of labs, um, they actually made uh, electrodes for calcium. These are liquid-liquid electrodes. You can read about what that means in your book. And they went and they measured the amount of calcium in the same exact standard. And as you can see, it's a very, very wide variation of data. And it was roughly a 4% error. But as you can see, some of these electrodes are way off. And that really, again, points out the fact that in this case, they couldn't just correct it from calibration because the issues were manufacturing issues with how they created that liquid-liquid electrode. And so, again, if you don't have to be really precise, this kind of ion-selective calcium measurement could be perfect for what you need to do. And certainly, if you need a time resolve, it may be the only way to get it. But if you really have the cap cap capacity to go and run it on an atomic spectrometer, you would have a much, much more accurate and precise set of values to work with. So let's just sort of summarize what are the key advantages of using an ion selective electrode over atomic spectroscopy. Now I'm going to tell you while you read this list, I left something out. So I want you to look at everything there and say, okay, real time data, that's really important. It's not something you can easily get from atomic spectroscopy. It's portable, you can use it in the field, it's small, it's versatile. Because of microelectronics, you can make it really cheaply. It's a linear response over four to six orders of magnitude, and it's non-destructive. One of the other advantages is that you actually don't need a lot of volume of material. You don't need like liters of material or even milliliters of material. You just need enough to sort of cover the surface of the electrode and get all the pieces in that you need. And if it's a miniaturized sensor, that could be a relatively small volume. Okay, what are some of the disadvantages? Well, it's certainly the number one disadvantage is going to be with both precision and accuracy. You've got sources of systematic error that come from the unknown junction potentials, and you also have sources of random error just in that it's very hard to simultaneously make electrodes similar, and junction potential can be dependent on a lot of different factors you may or may not control. So that's your biggest bugaboo with using an ion selective electrode. The detection limits can actually be pretty good. I looked up a couple of different detection limits for ISEs. We use them in my own lab for silver analysis. And, you know, I wouldn't have guessed 100 parts per billion, I think, to be on the safe side about a ppm. Um, they're fragile, so they don't last forever. So even though they're cheap, you may have to replace them a lot. And the electrodes can and do get clogged. So if you run them in dirty samples, their lifetimes are going to be much shorter than if you run them in, like, pure clean water with just metal that you're interested in. And finally, it's an interesting advantage and maybe disadvantage, is let's say you're trying to measure copper, but copper is bound to EDTA, which is a strong chelating agent. Well, in an electrochemical scheme, the copper bound to EDTA is chemically a different kind of species, and it's not going to be recognized or participate in the same electrochemical processes as free copper. So an ion-selective electrode measures only the free ion which, if you do it with atomic spectroscopy, can actually give you a picture of both the free ion and the bound ion and the total ion content. So I don't know if it's an advantage, but it's an important difference with atomic spectroscopy, which, again, measures the total ion concentration, because if copper is bound to EDTA, you know, you're putting it up into a plasma, 
and it's going to be copper. EDTA is going to be gone. Here, you're not doing that, right? You're measuring sort of the of chemically available copper is a good way to think about it. Anyhow, I hope that you've gotten your head a little bit that ion selective electrodes are a potentiometric measurement. They measure electrode potentials based on the minute changes in charge buildup at two different interfaces that are present in electrochemical system, uh, electrochemical cell. And that when you do an ion selective electrode, you're basically manipulating a kind of junction potential in a relatively quantitative way. But there are certain disadvantages, particularly related to the quantitative analysis of data that, depending on your need, could be problematic for you. Thanks so much. See you next time.